Hello, church family. I hope that all is well with each of you. I know the longer this goes on, the stress and the weight of some of this gets harder for some of you. And I want you to know that we continue to pray for you. Uh, some of our elders as well are under a degree of stress through all of this. We met again last, wi last night as we have every week to pray with you. And this week along with Gordon, our head deacon, and we prayed for some of you specifically in, in accordance with your needs and the difficulties that you're facing. So I want you to hear from me again that uh, this is not just something I say, that you are deeply in our hearts and we continue to pray for you all the time. I want to uh, give you some news today. First of all, I want to let you know that uh, our church retreat has been canceled. Uh, we think that is the better part of wisdom. It was set for the early part of June and at this point it just looks like the smartest thing to do. And so just know that uh, it's been canceled and we'll decide if there's any way to reschedule that later or not. There's just too many, uh, too many questions out there. Secondly, I want to say thank you for those of you who prayed for me and my preaching for Fair Oaks Church this last week. We recorded it on Friday. It went well. It was aired for them on Sunday. This week I'll be recording tomorrow, so I'll appreciate your prayers for that. And then they'll air it again on this coming Sunday. Uh, congratulations to my son Jordan and daughter-in-law Beth Ann and to the Humphrey family on the birth of their son, our sixth grandson, little Gideon Joel. He was born last Friday early morning. Mom and, and baby are well. And if you want to see some pictures, Sherry and I like doting grandparents. We posted some shots on our Facebook group, uh, the church Facebook group. So you can go there if you want to see pictures of them. So congratulations to them. The last bit of news has to do with benevolence. I want to let you know that three households in Costa Rica were helped again this last month and they uh, sent texts to me. They are deeply grateful for them in, in their situation and meant the difference between uh, eating or not eating. Uh, so they are deeply grateful for what you have given them. And then three households here in our Hispanic ministry, three households of four each, were helped again this last month and they expressed their gratitude to you as well. Well, those, that's the news for this week. Uh, now, in regards to a word of encouragement, you know, this, this shelter in place has caused a, a great deal of disorientation for all of us. Uh, in, in, in the rhythms of our life, have, be it with our exercises, be it with our work, but it's also affected our spiritual exercises, our spiritual disciplines, and our spiritual practices as well. In particular, our, our, not only our private, but our public ones here at church. And I want you to think about Daniel, now that we've returned to the book of Daniel. Here was Daniel in exile, and he had been there for almost 70 years. He had, was not able to attend the public meetings that God had ordered for them of sacrifices in the temple and so forth for nearly 70 years. And yet he is a, an individual who, by God's grace, of course, maintained his devotion to God. Uh, you know, the book of Daniel, uh, teaches us not only the theology of the sovereignty of God over all the kingdoms of man, but we've said in a practical way, the book of Daniel teaches us how to live distinctive lives of faith while in circumstances like Daniel. While we live in a pluralistic culture or we live under the duress uh, that he was experiencing, limitations placed upon us. That's what we can learn from the book of Daniel when you don't control everything. And you know, this prayer of Daniel's in chapter 9 that we began to look at this last Sunday, that didn't come out of nowhere. You remember that in the book of Daniel, he was recognized as a man of prayer. Remember, that was in chapter 6. Uh, so much so that those who wanted to rid themselves of Daniel uh, remembered that and made use of that against him. So this was a discipline of Daniel's. He was a person who maintained his private devotions uh, under circumstances that far exceed the temporary limitations that we're experiencing here. And something I didn't point out from chapter 9, uh, just time-wise this last week, is that Daniel there notes that when Gabriel came to him with the, with the answer, he notes that it was at the time of the evening sacrifice. What evening sacrifice? Daniel hasn't been to the temple in nearly 70 years, but he still tells time, if you would, by God's calendar. 
is that there's a man who is deeply God-centered even in a place that was so godless. Uh, just an amazing testimony, I think. And it, I think it should underscore for you and me that we live under the sovereignty of the very same God. Uh, I want to make some application from this, and that is, as a congregation, uh, some of our visible practices of worship, of course, have been you know, deeply affected. You know, for example, baptism, Lord's Supper, and in our public giving and so forth. I want to leave the Lord's Supper for next week, and I want to address this week our giving just a little bit. And by that, I don't mean the amount or regularity of it. I already said that your sacrificial support via the offerings has not waned. Praise God. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. But that has always been a personal matter between you and the Lord. That is the amount and all that. You, that has always been a personal matter whether you uh, were at church in, and giving in the offerings or whether you were at home. And now that you're at home, and we all have to be at home for the most part, uh, that remains a personal matter. Uh, but what has been lost, what has been lost is... Uh, the public gathering setting of worship, which that reinforces that everything we do there, which included offerings for us, is an act of worship. So when we gathered and we used to maintain uh, giving as, as an act that was done within the worship services, that was done deliberately to support the idea in your hearts that giving is an act of worship. And secondly, a second goal was to teach the coming generation, our children, that same thing, that giving is an act of worship. So I want to address this because that has been lost, the public element of it, and that reinforcement has been lost. First of all, along two lines, if you are alone at home, if you're single or let's say you're a married couple without any children, don't let giving become perfunctory for you. It's so easy to let it become that way. It's easy to view it as just something to check a box for and, you know, get it done off your list. I don't know, maybe for some of you it's even automatic. It's just a sort of direct deposit thing. Uh, I'm encouraging you on behalf of the elders to, to pause, whether you're writing the check or going online, to pause. Give thanks to God. Take nothing for granted. Praise Him. Pray for those who have less and uh, pray for the use of these funds that they would be done in a way that glorifies God. So that habit, that attitude alike to Daniel's is, is yours to maintain. It's your, it's your call. It's your discipline. Uh, and then secondly, uh, along the lines of families, parents, try to make your giving visible. What I just said about singles applies to you, but make it visible to your children. Instruct them along several lines during this time. Uh, to teach them that giving is an expression of love for Jesus, for all that he has done for us, and how in these hard times he's taking care of you, how in these hard times he's taking care of others through your giving, and share the giving that's going on in the benevolent fund and so forth. Instruct them that God loves willing and cheerful givers. Why? Because that's an expression of gratitude and faith, faith in God's provision. Third, instruct them that a willingness to be generous in giving is far more important than the amount that is given. And that should be especially applicable in their case. Because lastly, I would say uh, you may want to encourage them to, to add to your giving. Uh, some of these children used to give in their Sunday school and they can't be there any longer. Some of them used to give in the worship service. So don't overlook that. Don't let this all simply become perfunctory. How long this will go at this point, we still don't know exactly. Make the most of this time to teach your children that giving is an act of worship and seek to involve them. Uh, all in all, what I want to say about this is this, that this disorientation that we're all experiencing can, can lead us to think more about spiritual practices than we were before all this happened, you know? In some ways, some of the things we did could have become a mechanical routine, uh, a mechanistic, and maybe now, 
now in the stillness of the time that you have in this new rhythm of life, you can take advantage of this and be more thoughtful. Participate in a very thoughtful, prayerful, worshipful manner. Now we'll speak to the Lord's Supper uh, next week. I'm asking you to consider this. Let me end with the words of John Owen, uh, just to modify a quote of his. Uh, one thing that John the, Owen the Puritan said once, he said that the storms and winds can help fruit trees because it, it loosens the soil at the bottom, at the base of the tree, and this allows the fruit trees to sink their roots deeper. The fruit of which, he says, will only be seen much later. Well, I know it feels like the roots and the soil at the base of our, of our lives are being uprooted and, and moved around. Pray to God that He will send deeper roots of worship in your heart during this time and that the great fruit of this will be visible to all later. Now, lastly, in anticipation of our study in the last few verses of chapter 9 of Daniel, to enrich and deepen your experience, and I think, and your capacity to grasp and understand the main point uh, coming from those verses. You may consider reading not just Daniel 9 again, but reading a couple portions of Scripture, and I would point you to these two passages, to Leviticus 25, verses 8 through 22, on uh, the, the matter dealing with the, the Jubilee year, and then 2 Chronicles 36, uh, the last chapter there, 14 through 23. I think both of these will deepen your experience and help you grasp the main point this Sunday. Well, the Lord bless you. Be encouraged. We love you. We think of you all the time. And I'm looking forward to opening God's words with you this Sunday. So long.